You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney, and Snarky Faith is radio for the spiritually disenfranchised. If you've had enough of the insanity in Christianity, well, you've come to the right place. You can handle your conversations about faith with copious amounts of sarcasm and also a bit of this, then welcome home. We're glad you are here. So on today's show, we're going to talk about knockers and boobs. And maybe it's what you think it is, and maybe it's not. But that's all I'm going to say right now. (laughs) I'll have to leave that fresh in your mind saying, what the heck is this all about? Because before we descend into all this snark, just a reminder that this broadcast and all past podcasts can be found at snarkybait.com and wherever else you listen to podcasts, Apple, Amazon, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, we're here, we're there, we're everywhere. Just look for Snarky Faith. And if you want to interact more with the show, you can find the Snarky Faith page on Facebook. You can drop me a line at Stuart at snarkyfaith.com. And if you want to leave a message that'll probably end up on the air, you can record it on our website, snarkyfaith.com. Well, I hope everyone is doing well this week. For me, for me, looking back into last week, I will have to say that it, it is a weird time. And, and I say that because we start out the year. We start out the year with New Year's and it being high celebration. And now, six days later after New Year's, we get supposedly Epiphany when we're supposed to, ha- in the church tradition, have, hey, let's, let's celebrate the Lord during Epiphany. But no, now January the 6th, it's not Epiphany, it's, uh, it's Insurrectionist Day. And we are now over a year past the insurrection on the U.S. Capitol. And I have a lot of feelings about this. I, the whole week brought back a lot, but really what it ended me, ended up with me in my heart was just kind of more annoyed at the denial of all this stuff a year later that we're seeing from people. And, and I feel like that's actually, that's actually a really weird place for us to begin the show because in the show, we are going to be, we're still going through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, in the main portion of our show. And we are going to be talking about like kind of the difference between knockers and boobs. And we saw many boobs on display on January the 6th of 2021. And these are people that had nothing really to do with the Lord, but darn it if they didn't proclaim it. What are you talking about, Stuart? What are you talking about? Well, I'm going to begin our show. This isn't necessarily in the news, but we'll get to the news in a minute. But this, I I do not want us to forget. I do not want us to move past the craziness of that day and also miss out on the fact that January the 6th, 2021, was a show of Christian nationalism in America. And it was also a show just of how, like, white Christianity has morphed into some ugly... Thing. And then, you know, that, this is coming to you from a white guy who still thinks Jesus matters, but not in the way that these, not in the way that these folks think it matters. And the, where did we find this? This is over on the Religion News Service. Great, great, great post. Uh, Religion News Service had a, mm, this, was, this was a tough article for me to, to read through. And this is going to be something that we're going to actually kind of be bouncing around a little bit with in, in our main story. But it was, uh, they had an article entitled uh, January 6, A Timeline of Prayers by Jack Jenkins. And li- literally what they did was highlighted the public prayers that were involved in all that was going on that day. Some good, some bad as we marched through the day. But I wanted to highlight some of those because I think that we need to be able to see 
where things like Christian nationalism is eroding the faith, where it's eroding things in America. And, and I know we talk a lot about this kind of stuff on the show on a regular basis, but here's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer this to you. So these are some of the, gosh, insane prayers that they outlined in this article. Some of these insane prayers that were going on the day that we had an armed insurrection of our government trying to overturn an election based upon a bunch of lies and so intertwined with conservative evangelical Christianity, it is completely sick. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give some snippets just to kind of think about this, because this is how these folks think prayer is. Prayer is God gives me what I want, right? Okay. So during the rally, we had Florida pastor and White House official, Paula White. She opened up the Trump rally of the day. Um, she opened this up at 11 a.m. And I'm going to give you a little snippet of her prayer. Uh, I'll do it in my voice because I do not want to hear it in hers. But she said crazy stuff like this in the prayer. And I'm going to read this. I'm going to quote, direct quote from this. Okay, God, you said honor. You said honor your word and your name above all things. So as we hold you in covenant with you today, let justice be done. Let justice be done. Let justice be done. She's repetitive. Sorry. Going back. Uh, we let the people have the assurance of a, of a fair and just election. Hear our cry and turn our hearts to you, God. I pray that you would turn the hearts of those who are in power and positions to make decisions, to walk in your wisdom, and to do justly today for the integrity of democracy for our nation. This is Paula F. and White. And it is far too early in my show for me to start swearing. But this, this, this makes me also, <laughs> this, this thing makes me furious. This is, this is a great and beautiful example of what Christian nationalism has done to the faith. What is this? Oh, God, we want you to overturn an election? Oh, God, we want you to show people that... The, what is this? This is nonsense. This has nothing to do with reality or even, even how God works. But. She continues on, and it only gets grosser. No, yeah, you may need a barf bag or trash can nearby. God, she goes, we ask you right now, in conclusion, for your provision, for your protection, for your power, for an outpouring of your spirit like never before, I secure POTUS. I thank you for President Trump. I thank you that he has stood with Israel. Uh, he stood with life. He stood with righteousness. He stood with the most vulnerable. He has stood to alleviate poverty. He has stood for religious freedom. He has stood for safety and protection. And he has stood in place, God, that few men can stand. He has walked in your ways. I mean, this is like friggin' satire here, people. This is, this is like, this is, yeah, I'm sorry. It's like, don't look up stuff. Let me finish. And as you have allowed me to have a relationship with him and his family for 20 years, Right now, as his pastor, I put a hedge of protection around him. Oh, beautiful. See that my whole thing is what is the point in lying to God? Like this is this is just all nonsense. This is all nonsense. And they know it. This is what I'm gonna get at with all of this. They know it. They know it. Folks like Paula White and folks in the Christian crazy, they know that their shit stinks but they also know if they keep pressing it and pushing it and showing it to you in confidence that eventually some people are going to be like, okay, that's good for me. Yeah. Yeah. So now we went from those kind of folks. Now move down here. The proud boys, the proud boys, the proud boys knelt and prayed half an hour before they charged into the Capitol saying something along these lines. Again, quoting this, Dear Lord, we come to you today and we ask for protection and wisdom for our leadership here today as we, for the rest of our fellow Americans, Lord, uh, we pray that, uh, oh, you soften the hearts of those that have turned hard against you. We pray for all of those in our government that have turned harshly away. What does any of this have to do with the election? Uh, answer, nothing, 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 nothing. 
And if they are praying for wisdom, you know, I would hope if they were really seeking wisdom, the situation, God would be like, hey, 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 don't, <laughs> don't kill people. Don't ransack the capital. Don't try to have an armed insurrection. I think God would kind of be clear on that kind of stuff, but mm, no, 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 no. That's not quite how it works. Leading us to the end of this article here, then we even get, we even get to the, you know him and you love him, the QAnon shaman. That's right. They had busted into the Senate chambers and he decided to take off his uh, headpiece, his head mantle. I'm not really sure what kind of hat you would call he had. Uh, the, 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 maybe it's like a, hmm, how do I put this like a, maybe that's like a shaman beret. It's like shaman beret. I'm not really sure. Okay. But he goes, thank you, Heavenly Father, for gracing us with this opportunity to stand up for our God-given inalienable rights. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being an inspiration needed to these police officers to allow us in the building? Allow? That's a bit of a, that's a little bit of a, a generous statement, knowing that many of them were beaten and some of them were killed. To allow us to exercise our rights to send a message to the tyrants, the communists, and the globalists that this nation is not, look, this is not prayer. This, this is an excuse. This is an excuse for folks to continue to assume that their bad behavior has been ordained by God because essentially God is made in their own image. And I think it was Anne Lamont that said something along the lines of, uh, if, if, if God hates all the same people that you hate, you probably have made God in your own image. And this is quite that. Because this was a disgusting display of all things American Christian. It was a disgusting display of all things that have nothing to do with Jesus. Even though you saw the Christian flag there, you saw Trump flag, Jesus saves, John 3, 16, it was the whole hubaloo. But yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. But none of this had anything to do with Jesus. And oh, Jesus, where did they learn this stuff through? How did they learn this? It always harkens me back to that 80s PSA on TV. Where did you learn how to do this, son? Where did you learn how to do these drugs? I learned it from you, dad. <laughs> I learned it from you, dad. No. Where did these a-holes learn it from? Well, they learned it from their pastors. That's right, they did. They learned it from their pastors and prophets that continue to sell them a bill of goods that does not line up with reality. Now, the best example, the best way that I can use my spiritual giftings to be able to show to you, give you an example of, of what, what in the world could skew people so far beyond the gospel? What, what could make these Christians so terrible, so crazy? <laughs> well, that brings us to our segment of the week. The Christian crazy, the choices cuts of Christian nuts, the best of the worst. Here they are, and here we go. If loving the Lord is wrong, I don't want to be right. Lord have mercy. The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. To now I want to give a shout out to some folks that make the Christian crazy possible week after week. Uh, right Wing Watch. The Friendly Atheist, and Christian Nightmares over on Twitter. Oh, those guys, oh, they do so much work to mine, so much crazy. And, you know, we're going to hop in. A lot of times we go for the big name prophets, but today we're going to delve our toes. We're going to just dip it in a little bit, a little bit. To some of these smaller Baptist churches. Now, first one up, we've got this. Brother Brandon Darnell, who is at Pure Words Baptist Church. I love some of the names of these churches. Pure Words Baptist Church. So all I've got here is Brother Brandon's, Brother Brandon Darnell's closing prayer from his sermon. And my biggest question is, listening to his closing prayer, <laughs> what in God's name was this sermon about? I think you'll get a decent idea of it. But man, oh man, this is certain a way, certainly a way to close out a prayer. Let's close in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for everything you've done, Lord. 
We just pray that you just uh, help us to uh, the young ones and help us men and women to just avoid the whorish woman, not to become a whorish woman or to uh, partake in the whorish woman's deeds and become a whoremonger and to be disgusting and vile, Lord. You just help us to just walk in newness of life and walk in righteousness and just just lead us by the still waters, Lord. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name, I pray. Amen. So is that like the scale of like whoredom? So you were either like the whorish woman or you're a whoremonger? I mean, there has to be like somewhere in between, but I don't know. I don't know. About that guy. I want to go to that guy's church. And that is sarcasm in its thickest because it's only going to get worse as we go further. Next up, brother Jason Grabber. Was that his brother? Jason Grabber from Sure Foundation Baptist Church. Now, he's going to give us here a little lesson in history. Side note, none of this makes any sense, but it, it, I love watching him try. And the metric system, just like the Catholic Church, is actually an antichrist system because uh, evidently it was invented by the French atheists during the French Revolution to try to get rid of Christ, any, anything that had anything to do with Christ, out of their society. And so miles are in the Bible, and so they had to get rid of miles because, you know, that's, that's biblical and we can't have any of that. So that's why they invented the metric system. And uh, so, you know, feet are better than, than kilometers, all right? Feet are better than kilometers. It's sounding here like Brother Jason's got a little bit of a foot fetish going on here. I think he needs to watch it because he may be coming very close to whoremongering. This is kind of more like, you know, Mm, tramp tempting or like you know like a little like sneaky slutty i'm not really sure the scale on this but i'm worried about the brother i am worried about him not really now if you want to talk about someone that i'm honestly worried about this guy this guy jason pastor jason shelley if 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 I have never met another person that has the love of the Lord in his heart and all of creation, it's this man. This man wants to protect everything. Wait, no? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Exactly the opposite. <laughs> this guy is a monster. If there is an animal that's prohibiting anything about humankind, kill it. Amen. People would be like, well, I can't go out soul winning. Who's going to watch little Fido? <laughs> Bring him over. I got a gun. <laughs> Kill it. Why would you let a dog stop you from doing the work of the Lord? What kind of ministry are you in that requires you to do the work of the Lord in a way that you need to kill dogs that are holding you back from doing it? Like, I, it even makes me question, like, how does this guy have a day job? And I remind you, these three asshats are pastors preaching in actual sermons in actual churches. Yes. Yes. Now, these are the normal ass hats that we fill the Christian crazy with. We have those too. These guys have a smaller platform, but they still have congregations and they are still preaching this kind of insanity. So, who'd they learn it from? Let's look at one of the OG grifters of prophecy, Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland's telling you a little history story here about how it. Used to be so dangerous to speak in tongues. Kind of makes him sound like a badass. But we all know he's just an ass. And there have been th there have been persecutions where people have died in certain times in the United States of America because they spoke in tongues. But now there's just so many of us. <laughs> the devil can't kill us all. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for that. But that can't happen no more. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. I just say stuff, and people keep sending me money, right? Because remember when everyone's calling out Kenneth Copeland for all of him and his private jets? Oh, oh, oh. If this doesn't piss you off, this should. This is a pastor from... Kenneth Copeland's church, prosperity pastor, Tony uh, Suarez, who is defending the prosperity gospel because pandemic, because anti-vaxxing. Yeah, he goes there 
and you just want to kick him directly in the dick when he does it. The message of prosperity was never about us walking around and everybody having a Bentley, but it was for this moment. We need to, we need to, for, we need to ask God to forgive us, and some of y'all need to email Kenneth Copeland and a few others and apologize for what you said. Because they were preparing us for this moment. Because now they're saying I can't get on an airplane if I don't get a vaccine. This is attacking the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I got news for you. If you tell me I can't get on an airplane, then I'm going to buy my own airplane in Jesus' name. But you're not going to stop us from preaching the gospel of Jesus. This is an attack on the kingdom of God. They're trying to shut us down from preaching. But the devil is a liar. Oh, the devil's a liar. Oh, the devil's a liar. Is, is your boss the devil? Are you talking about Kenneth Copeland? Because for such a time as this, Bentley's for all of our staff. God, right? Right? That kind of works with scripture such a time as this. We needed all of this. I like the idea that he's he first starts out there. Happy and the prosperity gospel is not about all of us having Bentleys. I mean, we do, but it's not all about that because, I mean, you need jets. I mean, you need planes. You need multiple houses. You need bling. You need watches. You need all this kind of swag. Don't people know that you cannot preach the gospel without all this swag? Because, again, the devil is a liar and God is good because money, 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 blah, 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 blah. Gimme, 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 gimme. We're a bunch of grifters and none of this has to do with Christ at all. None of this is biblical. This is just an industry. This is just an industry, just like the travel industry, because you get to travel to these places where you can go and take your brain out of your head and say, fill it up, prophets. Fill it up, pastors. I'm so tired of reality. I mean, honestly, when people usually get tired of reality, they go and smoke pot. These people go and listen to these assholes that love to grip. I mean, honestly, well, you know, we talked about whoremongering and the whorish sluts earlier, right, in the show. We all talked about all that. Is, wait, is this what they were talking about? Is this the whoremongering? It actually kind of does seem like the whoremongering. Wait, were they prophesying against each other? I may should have not made fun of good old brother Brandon earlier because apparently he was prophesying about all this whoremongering that the televangelists and fake prophets do. You know how to spot a fake prophet? People ask me that all the time. Stuart, how do you spot a fake prophet? You just use your eyes and look at it and say, hey, there's Robin Bullock. Case in point, the last one we got here for the Christian crazy, Robin Bullock does something that I absolutely love. And by that, I mean that very, very thick with sarcasm. It's laying out prophecies in retrospective like he is laying these out like oh i had a thing before you didn't know it but god did it but i'm gonna tell you about it now i was standing on a stage and i heard this in the spirit i was standing on the 11th hour stage and i heard i heard a conversation i told the people about it i heard a conversation about shipping Shipping and ships and things like that. And they're going to create a crisis. And they're going to try to create this crisis. And I told them, and I sent word to the rightful president of the United States. What I heard. And I said, you have to do something. Something must turn now. If they're allowed to do this, the Lord said they're going to do something in 2030 that's irreversible. Ooh, case in point for prophets. You kind of just randomly throw around dates and make crap up as you go. It sounds better. So that morning I was standing on the stage and I heard the Lord said, I'm going to do a miracle with a ship. And I told the thing. And then that ship got stuck in the Suez. And they backed up 320 ships full of food and said it was going to throw the world into a crisis that we couldn't hardly recover from. And then suddenly the ship freed itself and came out. There was a lot to that. I don't think there was a lot to that. I think you keep hearing ship, ship, ship. I think God kept telling you, Robin, shit, shit, shit. 
That's the only thing I can come up with because what the Suez Canal thing happened like March of 2021. And now you're telling us, oh, what other world events have you predicted (laughs) in hindsight? It doesn't work that way, but that's never stopped him before. And lastly, don't we all remember it miraculously freeing itself? No, we don't, because that didn't happen that way. That's not how it happened at all. That's not prophecy. That is just rewriting history. So, all right, I've had enough of these boobs. Hopping into our main discussion today, we have been going through bit by bit over the last couple of weeks, the Sermon on the Mount, the centerpiece to Jesus's form of ethics. We're trying to go through this in the mindset of being able to really look to see, hey, like, what is he actually getting at? What is he actually getting at? And as we talked about Christian nationalism earlier, we can see how easily it is to, to twist the words of Jesus to make it make sense to people, as, as, as you can even see in the Christian crazy, how easy it is to twist stuff that's not even scripture and sell it like it's scripture and still sell it off like Jesus. And so that's been one of the main reasons we've been doing this. We've been journeying through the book, Taking Jesus at His Word by Addison Hodges Hart. Uh, And this week, this week, we are going to be talking about knockers, asking, seeking, and knocking. And in the previous weeks that we have been going through, um, we have been kind of walking through talking about how we are to act in the world around us, how we're to act in community with others, and and in those kind of things. And and speaking of community, for me, it's kind of been interesting, especially with, with Omicron surging right now in the United States, because first of all, during the holidays, I had my two college kids back with my two high school kids in the house. So for a while, it was it's very tight. We've got like a thousand square foot house and you've got a bunch of people packed into it and then and then and then my daughter's best friend also ended up kind of coming to stay with us because her parents ended up coming down with covid so it has been claustrophobic a bit for me as i would say lately and so what it which really led me to do is to get out and to find my peace outside and so what i've been really trying to do is to get out especially even if it's cold but get out in the sun and just go walk. And just what I've been doing is kind of not even praying when I'm out there. I'm just really walking and trying to notice beauty around me. And as I've been doing that, I've been doing it just to clear my head, but beginning to kind of what hit me after a couple of days of doing this was, was the words of brother Lawrence. Uh, when he said this, he said, she talking about God, she does not ask much of us, merely a thought of her from time to time, a little act of adoration Sometimes to ask for her grace, sometimes to offer her your sufferings, at other times to thank her for your graces, past and present. She has bestowed on you in the midst of your troubles to take solace in her as often as you can. Lift up your heart to her during your meals and in company. The least little remembrance will always be the most pleasing to her. One need not cry out very loudly. She is nearer to us than we think. And I've been trying to practice this kind of act of contemplation as I've been going through here, just being able to, to try to center myself and find, find beauty in the world. And <laughs> as we talked earlier about uh, this, this day, this day of insurrection, it, and especially looking at where we are in the world today with, with let's see, COVID, with our country being very divided, it, a lot of times the news is not particularly encouraging. And so being able to, to find beauty in the day has been something I've been trying to do. And, and I think even being able to find beauty and, and walk through that is, 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 is in, in, in essence, a bit of a prayer. So what I have been doing is, has been really just trying to connect and see where God is at work around us. Now, earlier in this whole series, we talked through the Lord's Prayer, really just being like, the center of all of these ethics for what Jesus is talking about and how we relate to God in this. Uh, And what we now move to is is a section that I think oftentimes is very, very misunderstood, but we're going to dig into the scripture, but also through it, we're going to dig into the kind of cultural context, the inherent Jewishness of what is going on in these scriptures. And I think that 
you may find, as I have done as well, uh, I've heard this preach one way, and I really think it is meant to be accepted in a different way. I think Christ's intent is not always the way that we hear this preached through very American eyes and perspectives. Okay, so hopping in, we are going Matthew 7. It's going to be Matthew 7. And it's Matthew 7, verses 7 through 12. Okay? Very common one. You've heard this before. Um, and it starts like this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then he switches gears a little bit, saying this. Which of you, if your son or daughter asks for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for fish, we'll give him a snake. And if you then, um, and if you then, though you are evil, know not how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And this for this sums up the laws and the prophets. So we're going to be talking today through the ask, seeking, and knocking. We're also going to talk through this bit of weird analogy that Jesus gives that leads us then to what we also call the golden rule. All right? So let's, let, let's, let's hit this up first. So let's the first part. Okay? Jesus says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Okay, so this analogy, very, very, very famous, very, very famous. But um, one thing I, I, want, I want to point out, and, and as this, this continues to move forward, last week we had talked about the scripture talking about uh, valuing the things that are, are sacred and, and the doggedness that God asked us to kind of seek truth. Like this idea that like to understand God's wisdom, there, there ends up being a, a bit of a doggedness as we go out and seek for that wisdom. Okay, so much in the same way we are seeing this, and and especially if you were a, a a person in the first century back then, one thing that you're going to be hearing in the in this in this set is that this is a very. This is something that you would actually see in a certain tense from people that were begging, right? Ask, knock, seek, just go after this. So so so, okay. One thing that I I, I love I love I love. And, and I think that it's something that can oftentimes get lost to us, especially in our current context, um, is thinking through the ideas of, hey, what, what were his listeners hearing at this time? Right? What were the disciples hearing? Well, um, one thing, to be a, 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 a student of the Old Testament or, or a Jewish scholar, folks in these times, this is what they would be hearing. So this first one, so we're going to, or let's talk about the second one first. We're going to talk about knocking. In Jewish tradition, in Jewish tradition, the word knocking is another expression for prayer. And guess what about asking? Yep, that's about prayer too. So anyone want to guess what the last one's going to be about? It's also, it's also about prayer. So really, so I'm going to read this through again. And, and I think this really begins to change us because I think sometimes, oftentimes, people are just like, oh, 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 this is like, this is like for Santa Jesus, but let's just read this again. So, so think about it like this. So pray and it will be given to you. Pray and you will find. Pray and the door will open to you. For everyone who prays receives. And the one who prays finds. And the one who, and to the one who prays, the door will be open. Now, yes, 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 yes. You can hear a lot of this in, in a different manner, but, but then let's begin to kind of dive into what did we learn about prayer from the Sermon on the Mount? Like what, what, is, what is Jesus saying when we say prayer? Because oftentimes if we've been raised around a Christian church, we can, when we think of prayer, we either think of people standing uh, in a pulpit or a lectern giving flowery words that don't sound normal or human when trying to address God, like in corporate prayer, like, O oh, heavenliest of fathers, O oh, Lord of lords, beseech upon us, blah, 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 blah. That kind of stuff. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. A lot of that public prayer is, is I feel like <laughs> it's just pageantry. And getting back to what I mentioned at the beginning, Brother Lawrence saw prayer as simply just being able to offer thanks. And, and 
Brother Lawrence was known for practicing the presence of God. And what that really was about was about being awake and aware to what is going on around him, uh, whether it be people in his community, whether it be what's happening in nature, whether it be what is happening in the world at large. But part of this idea is that the prayer is not necessarily just done on our hands and knees. Prayer is not necessarily done in the quiet. Prayer is done as we go about walking into the world. So, I mean, part of it is this is not like a clasping of the hands, closing of the eyes, a bowing of the heads to show reverence for the Lord. No, that's not really how it works. Here's, and this is, this is something that I, I, I've, I've come to understand the longer I have, have journeyed through this and kind of had to untangle prayer from what a lot of church tradition ended up kind of messing up in my own head. First of all, uh, prayer is simply just communicating with the divine. Yeah, it's like talking. Like in a certain sense, I'm talking right now. In the same way that I talk to you guys on the show, I talk to God in the same way. I, I try to stay awake and aware of what God's doing um, around me. Like when I talk about walking out in nature to clear my head, to get out uh, of my space where I'm working in, when I get out to go for a walk, what I'm trying to do is saying, oh, oh, I know my, all of my junk that, that I have to do. I know everything that's soaring through my head, all my list of all that I've got to get through in the day. We, we all do this, right? And oh, oh, oh. But sometimes we need to stop and have those moments to contemplate. We're able to walk and realize that there are bigger things moving around us, that our problems are going to be there waiting for us <laughs> when we return. Uh, but at the same time, we need to be able to unplug, to be able to, whether it's unplug from screens or unplug from work, but unplug to be able to let us step out and be able to see things for as they are. Because so much of the focus of what Christ has been doing in the Sermon on the Mount, so much of the focus of prayer in this is about how we're engaging the world around us. I feel like Christianity, like American Christianity, has made prayer very selfish and has made prayer very abstract, if you think of it, right? So like, I pray, God's mysterious, far away, and I'm just like, I'm whispering these into the divine. Hey, hey, hey. But one thing I've, I've, I have grasped onto is, that, is this idea that we pray as we go. Meaning that when Jesus, in the Bible, when they talk about praying without ceasing, it's this idea that we pray as we go. Or am I always heads, heads down and eyes closed? No, no. But offering prayers during the day, offering something that pulls me outside of my head, that's able to help me say, oh, how can I help these people in this situation? What, what do I need to do? And maybe it's just simply I need to breathe and take a break. So, so much of this that we've seen through the Sermon on the Mount has, has been teaching us about like the postures that we are supposed to have, uh, how we are called to engage those around us, uh, which is love our neighbors, love our enemies, love. So there's a lot of love involved in this. And sometimes people are hard to love. So sometimes it's going to bring us to a position where we're just asking God, help me in this situation. So remember this, yes, seeking to, seeking to broaden who we are changes us. And to begin to see that prayer as, as like a, a quest or, or an expectation changes us. And what, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is that too often when I said like prayer is an abstraction, I have had to learn to pray, but pray as if God will be using me in certain situations. Now, am I saying that like, I'm the holy one and I'm chosen? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying um, is, is kind of in these scenarios. So if, if my neighbor, let's say my neighbor loses their job and my neighbor is like, I'm having trouble paying my mortgage this month, right? So I can go, okay, I'll pray for you. Go home, pray, God fix this. Why would God care about situations that I'm not even willing to invest in? You see what I'm saying? So I, I really feel like this idea of prayer is meant to connect us with other people, connect us with God, but not just to connect us with God so we float around like in the ether. No. Prayer is meant... <clears throat> prayer is meant 
to ground us in reality, ground us in what's happening around us, get us out of our heads to be able to understand that we depend on others, that we depend upon God, but also that others depend on us, that our action is needed. It grounds us in the here and now. And even like what we looked at earlier, all of those boobs on January the 6th, talking about these abstractions, these things that had nothing to do with reality. They wanted God to change reality. And that's not what this asking and seeking and knocking's about. Like, if we're going to be, we want to say to ourselves, Stuart, how do I become a good knocker? I know that's so bad. <laughs> um, but how we are called to do that is, 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 is simply to be invested more in the world around us and engaging others and engaging God as we move through our days. It makes us less selfish, more awake and more aware of what is happening and what needs to be done to help others. This, 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 this like asking, seeking, knocking version of prayer is, is dogged, it's driven, it's, 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 it, it is meant to create change to create change in our own hearts and it creates change in the world around us. You see, that's what we're getting here with the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is coming back again and again saying, hey, guess what? It's not about you. Hey, it's not about being in power. Hey, it's not about all this kind of stuff. No, it's about uh, loving your neighbor, loving your enemies. It's about loving God. It's about doing good in the world around you. It's about investing in others. It is not about accumulating wealth. It is not about accumulating power. It is not about forcing other people to your will. It is not about any of these other kind of things that seem very mm, power-based, capitalism, ba capitalistically based, and authoritarian based, which is what a lot of those prayers that we were hearing on the six were about. God, fix this. God, I don't like these people. God, God, God. When at the same time, God just continues to call us God continues to call us to be engaged with the world as it is and to begin to do the work to make it a better place through what we give to it, not through what we force it to be. And I think that's a very, very important distinction for how we deal with prayer. That prayer is always engaging us with the problem and with the situation that we're talking about. And prayer also continues to draw us back to the fact that we need God and we need others. Prayer is a connecting device. It's not simply a throw a wish in a bottle and write, write it, write, write your message in a bottle and throw it out into the spiritual realms and hopefully the Lord will rescue us. If prayer isn't connecting you to what's happening in the world around us and to how that you may also be an answer to someone else's prayer, I kind of think you're doing it wrong. I kind of think you've just turned it into a really, 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 really selfish thing. But Jesus doesn't just stop there. He keeps going. Jesus launches into this weird analogy, but it'll seem a little bit less weird if you just kind of let me unpack it. So we're at nine, uh, verse nine, where Jesus says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Okay, seems kind of weird and odd, but if you were living in the area of Galilee during that time, this wouldn't be so weird of an analogy to use because a lot of the time, one, uh, in that time, especially in that region, what they did for bread a lot of times, it was more like flat bread. So it was like flat bread that may look like a stone, right? Right? And also, we know the disciples and other people near the Sea of Galilee, fishing. Fishing was a big thing there too. So if you're in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you're going to give analogies about the Packers. If you're in first century near Galilee, you're going to talk about breads and stones and fishes and snakes, okay? But what he's trying to set up here is essentially saying this, okay? We're setting up like an evil situation. Like, which of you out there, if your parents, if your kid asked you, 
or some bread, you're going to give him a rock? No, no. And then he continues on saying, if, if you then, though you are evil, know how good, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Okay, again, asking, we're talking about prayer. And this is not the kind of thing where you're just asking for anything kind of like a Santa Claus type of a God. I'm not going there, no. And, and the thing I think oftentimes when you hear this preached, we get caught up in this idea where Jesus says here, if you then, though you are evil. So in this, in this, evil here is translated just being morally uh, not up to snuff in this, in this thing, morally not where you're supposed to be. So he's speaking to the crowd here. You, you, you are not, you are sinful. You're not like God. And you still do good things for your kids, right? So God's saying here, so even morally bad people still do good things, right? Because we're all morally bad people. <laughs> so essentially, this is not about sinfulness. This is really just here speaking and emphasizing about God's goodness. Because as we've walked through the Sermon on that, we've continued to see about prayer, depending upon God, leaning on God, and focusing to the things that matter to the kingdom of God. Very, very practical here. And then we shift towards the end to the thing that you know called the golden rule. So in everything, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. All right. So we've heard that do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I saw this quote this week from, it's from Reverend Mark Sandlin. And I thought he hit it on the head. This, he, he made a great point about this. And here's what Reverend Mark Sandlin said. We've missed the goal. We've missed the point of the golden rule. It's not to treat people as we'd like to be treated. It's to treat people as we'd like to be treated. If we were in their shoes. It's a subtle difference that makes a massive difference. One more time. The distinction he's making here, the golden rule is not about treating people as we'd like to be treated. It's about treating people as we'd like to be treated if we're in their shoes. So I thought, I loved how he put that. And I do believe a lot of this, I'm going to give you some history too to say, you may say, Stuart, that doesn't line up totally with what the Bible says. And I, yes, it does. So now we're going to hop over to the Jewish New Testament commentary here. And they're going to give us, I'm going to quote from them, they're going to give us a little bit of background of this. Because, hey, guess what? This golden rule stuff, it precedes Jesus. What? It does. Okay. So the golden rule can be found in Jewish writings as early as the apocryphal book of Tobit, which is around 3rd century BCE. Well, they said this, what you hate, do to no one. Which is, again, a difference here, right? The things that you absolutely hate, don't do that to anybody. You hate it when people do it to you. Don't do it to other people. Like I've told that to my kids all the time. You don't like it when your brother does that to you. So why would you do it? Yeah, so you get it. Okay. <laughs> so continue on here. And uh, similar sayings are attributed to uh, Socrates, Aristotle, Confucius. Um, Rabbi uh, Hillel expressed it in the, in the generation before Yeshua in a famous passage in the Talmud comparing uh, Hillel with his contemporary Shemamai and tells the story. A pagan came before Shemamai and said to him, make me a proselyte, but on one condition that you teach me the entire Torah while I'm standing on one foot. Shemamai drove him off with the builder's measuring rod, which he had in his hand. And when he appeared before Hillel later told him, what is, uh, what is hateful to you? Do not do this to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. So the rest of the commentary, as he put it, said, now go and learn it. So we see the golden rule kind of crop up in the Old Testament, and Jesus is doing what he does best here, taking something that the people understand to be. He's twisting it and radicalizing it and pushing this towards educating them about what matters in the heart of the kingdom of God. And if we're not picking it up already, it's about us being well-connected with heaven and earth. It is about us 
being awake and aware of what's happening in our communities and around us. It's, it's about knowing and loving our neighbor. It's about knowing and loving our enemies. It's about changing the world in small bits, one moment at a time. And in this also, I, I appreciate it since we've been bouncing around using his words, oftentimes, Addison Hodges Hart puts it well like this when we talk about the golden rule. It applies both to those within and to those outside the community, as the entire sermon up to this point makes abundantly clear. And it isn't a philosophy to be taken up lightly, nor is it a smorgasbord of good advice. Picking and choosing uh, from it is not invited. In fact, in no uncertain terms, Jesus will make the point that his teaching is crucial and requires single-mindedness. What he's getting at here is this. I'm giving you guys a picture of what I am talking about. I'm giving you a picture of this kingdom of God. Do you want to be a part of this? Do you want to walk in this? Do you want to embrace this? And, and as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the show, it was when we were talking about the prayers that were echoing and resonating on January the 6th and how weird and bizarre and frankly, on Jesus-y they were, and about how, in many ways, I feel like much of modern-day American Christendom has forgotten why we have prayer to begin with. We've made it something that is overtly spiritual. We've made it something that is about like the here and ever after and not really the here and now. We've made it something where we are just passing stuff off to God, but in a disconnected way. So we have to remember here that the message is very simple. And I guess the point I was trying to get at is I feel like we make the message very complicated so we can spend time, I mentioned before, sounding smart and making sure other people need to rely upon us to understand what are we supposed to do? What does God want us to do? God couldn't have made it that simple. He actually did. But the Bible's so long. Yeah, a lot of the Bible is just really about people not getting it right and then needing a course correction. So the simple message, the simple message of the gospel of Christ is that God loves you just as you are. Like right now, not like tomorrow, not like before, no, now. So like you are, you are loved, you are loved by the creator of the universe. You are loved exactly as you are. And to be a part of this kingdom of heaven simply just means we try to walk in the wisdom of God as we seek to engage others in community and reach out to others in love and help and compassion. One of the reasons we like to make it complicated is because we don't want to do it. It's easier, it's easier to have Bible study upon Bible study upon Bible study talking about what we're supposed to do. It's hard to actually go and do it. Mm -hmm. And I said this before, and I will say this again. I believe that there is almost no way, I'm going to say there's no way for you to fully understand the gospel unless you begin to walk it out. This is a very experiential kind of a thing. You can sit and bury your nose in the Bible all day, but you're not going to understand it. Why? Well, it requires something of you to stop your stuff and go and help someone in their own stuff. Does that make sense? Like for us to be able to, to fundamentally change the way that we exist from being busy towards trying to orient our life around others, around helping others, around doing good in our communities, about loving people, about not judging people. So again, as we've been journeying through the Sermon on the Mount, I'm not seeing a whole lot of offensive stuff. I'm seeing a lot of offensive stuff if, you're, if you have the religious yoke about you. You know, I see that being challenging, but really, 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 Jesus is being very simple here. And when we live in a culture that is very materialistic and capitalistic, and we have a church that has adopted itself to be much like the systems in our culture, well, then we're going to have to get really fancy in how we talk about the simplicity of Christ, right? We're going to have to, oh, you have to learn all this stuff. You need to know all of this. No, no, no. Quite early in the Gospels, Jesus sends off his disciples, and frankly, they're a bunch of knuckleheads, and they're not well-educated, and they don't fully get it, but God was with them. Just like God is with you right now. Wherever you're at, in your own space, doesn't matter what you've done, God is with you. And God isn't asking for perfect people to be able to rise up and to be able to take on 
uh, the mantle of the kingdom of heaven? No. God wants ordinary people doing ordinary amounts of goodness in their ordinary lives. God wants us just to show up, to be better humans to one another, and, and to seek to tear down the things which consume us, dehumanize us, and blind us to what really matters in life. So as I end this broadcast, just a reminder that you can catch this show and all past shows on podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can even head on over to www.snarkyfaith.com. But, but I just want to leave you reminded with this one idea. This kingdom of heaven thing that Jesus keeps talking about, this, this unfurling of the kingdom of God, it only happens with you. It only happens with any of us just showing up in a way that is tangible and that creates positive change in those that we encounter. As I do every week, I send you off with the holiest amount of grace and peace and snark. Make sure to show up more in your own life because I think all of us need you to. The world needs more of you and less of these other boobs we talked about earlier in the show. So get out there. Be a bunch of knockers. <laughs> that was an analogy that never really made sense the entire show, but I'm out of here. Peace.